Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, where we discuss the important events that would have taken place in Guyana over the past week or so. And as is the norm, we have a packed agenda of issues to discuss this evening. I want to begin by welcoming all of our viewers who are joining us on television from Region Number 5, West Coast, Barbies. Welcome to another program of Issues in the News. Also to our viewers who are joining us on television across the Barbies River on the east bank of the Barbies River, New Amsterdam, Kanji, and along the quarantine coast, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. To our listeners and viewers who are joining us on Freedom Radio from Rob Street, Georgetown, Welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And last but not least, to the thousands of you who are joining us on Facebook Live from across the length and breadth of Guyana, the Caribbean, North America, and Europe. Welcome to another program of Issues in the News. Please press that share button on your phone. Please share this program so that your friends and your followers can be part of tonight's discussion and we can have the widest possible audience. Again, I repeat, press that share button on your phone, on your computer, on your laptop, on your iPad or whatever device you're using to view this program. Press that share button so that your friends and your followers can join us in tonight's discussion. Also, please take the opportunity to use the comment section to inform me of any questions you wish me to answer or any uh, issue that you wish me to comment on. Tell me that through the medium of the comment section. I want to recognize Narendat Sharma, Rajin Datadin, Cyril Ragobir, Chi Dawarka Prashad, Usha Ram Samuj, Pam Singh, Vibert Stevenson, and so many of you from across Guyana, and of course the diaspora. Welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News. Last week I missed um, the program because I was required to be in Den Haag at the International Court of Justice in the Netherlands, where I appeared with our legal team at a meeting summoned by the President of the International Court of Justice of both Guyana and Venezuela to do basically a case management seminar and to give certain directions after Venezuela would have submitted its memorial in answer to Guyana's memorial. A statement was issued outlining the directions that were given by the president of the court and there is no need for me to repeat those directions here but we await a formal notification from the ICJ in respect of the directions that the court would make in terms of the future conduct of the matter. So we are awaiting that formal notification from the court as the president of the court indicated to us when we attended the case management seminar. Another important event that took place recently was the adoption of Guyana's fourth round mutual evaluation report by the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force at its 58 plenary and working group meetings held from the 2nd of June 2024 to the 7th of June 2024 in Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago. Guyana Guyana's financial system was under review. This review process lasted for approximately two years 
it was intense and almost every aspect of Guyana's financial and legal architecture relative to our AML CFT structures were examined in great details by assessors appointed by the financial, the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force. They examined our legislation. They examined our policies. They examined the functions of various agencies in our financial and um, economic architecture, including our banking system, the private sector, our um, mineral sector, our law enforcement apparatus, our judiciary and the approach by the judiciary to AML CFT matters, the number of AML CFT matters which we have in the system, the number of cases which we have in the system, and our, as I said, our mining sector, our revenue collection agencies, all the operations of these various sectors came under scrutiny. We had both off-site and on-site examination. The on-site examination occurred last year, September, and it lasted for a period of two weeks where the assessors came to Guyana and interacted directly with a number of agencies, including the Guyana Gold Board, the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission, the Guyana Revenue Authority, the Gaming Authority, the Central Bank and Commercial Banks, the private sector, the law enforcement agencies, including CANU, the Guyana Revenue Agency, SOCU, the Financial Intelligence Unit, the cooperatives, the chief co-op officer and their department, the deeds and commercial registry, and a host of other uh, state sectors came under examination and the officers from these various agencies were interviewed and interrogated and volumes and volumes of information was re were requested and supplied. And that wealth of data and empirical evidence was collected and examined by the assessors using the internationally set criteria by the Financial Action Task Force adopted by the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force. When that process was completed, a draft evaluation, mutual evaluation report was presented to Guyana, and then there was another engagement that allowed us to make inputs into that draft report. When that draft report was then finalized, it was taken to the plenary. And at the plenary, the assessors presented their draft report on Guyana. And at a forum that included some 200 experts, Guyana's report was interrogated and examined critically and clinically by a room full of 200 delegates and or experts in the field. It is a mutually evaluation, it's a mutual evaluation exercise. What that means is that all the members 
of CFATF were present and other important agencies. So you had, for example, every country in the Caribbean had representatives there at a ministerial level as well as at the financial intelligence unit level and even below that. So oh, you have all the countries in the Caribbean with representatives there. Then you have the CFATF executive, the, the executives themselves. Then you have, you had the International Monetary Fund representatives. You had representatives from the World Bank. And then you have a, representatives from the Financial Action Task Force, the headquarter organization based in Paris. And you had Represent representatives from the United States, Canada, um, you, uh, the United Kingdom, and of course, as I said, representatives from the Caribbean, including the Turk and Caicos Islands, the British Virgin Islands, the um, Cayman Islands, etc. So it was a big gathering of experts and Guyana's mutually mutual evaluation report was was thoroughly and clinically and critically examined by these persons and the assessors as well as Guyana Guyana's delegation had to field questions and proffer explanations when questions were asked and explanations were sought. I will say that it was a rigorous process. It was a very probative, probative exercise. And the, as the assessors as well as the experts discharged their functional responsibility diligently and efficiently. And in the end, Guyana's financial structure, Guyana's financial system, and Guyana's mutually, mutual evaluation draft report was accepted. And the draft report was a favorable one in all the areas examined. And there were a number of areas that were examined. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate the, our assessors and to express to them our deepest gratitude for a professional job done. I want to also thank the team of experts that scrutinized and, and, and interrogated our report. I want to thank them for the work that they did and for their positive endorsement of Guyana's financial system as well as our mutual evaluation report. And last but not least, I want to thank the team of hardworking Guyanese from the different sectors who worked assiduously and tenaciously over a period spanning two years in, in the mutual evaluation process. And these include officers from the various agencies that I have earlier outlined. Starting from the Bank of Guyana right across the financial sector of the state. Also the mining sector, the gaming authority, Cooperatives officer, the Guyana Revenue Authority, the Guyana Gold Board, the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission, the Financial Intelligence Unit, SOCO, the Guyana Police Force, CANU, GRA, all these agencies coalesced their efforts. And in the end, Guyana was able to acquit itself and its financial system with distinction in that very probative and interrogating and grueling 
assessment to which we were subject. In the end, we got congratulatory messages from all the persons who were there and the agencies that they represented and the countries that they represented. We obviously received congratula congratulatory sentiments from the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force and the Financial Action Task Force. We received commendations also from the regional security system and I personally received a phone call from the Commonwealth Secretary General congratulating Guyana for being able to sustain the type of scrutiny to which we are subject and doing so without any adverse recommendations. Of course, the process continues and we still have some follow-up actions to, to complete, which we obviously plan to do. But there are many, many countries in the Caribbean that went through this exercise and did not come out the way that Guyana successfully did. Barbados, Trinidad, Jamaica, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, Dominica, they have problems and they are still going through all sorts of, 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 of follow-up actions at the level of the Financial Action Task Force. Guyana went, gone, gone, got clear, we went through without any of those adverse consequences. The reason why I have taken this opportunity to give you such a comprehensive update is to say that as the subject minister with responsibility for Guyana's AML CFT architecture and by extension its connection to the financial system is to say to you that we went through the lawful regulatory examination and Guyana came out with flying colors, meaning that our financial system and our AML CFT architecture does not pose a risk of any kind having regard to international standards. That's the whole purpose of that mutual evaluation exercise. Guyana's financial system and its AML CFT credentials were, were certified by the authorized agency as being in a good state of health. Now I come to the comments which I've seen being made about our financial system having regard to the recent disclosures made by the United States of America implicating the Mohammed's business enterprise and May Toussaint, who is a former uh, permanent secretary. I have seen it being said that these disclosures will have a negative impact and will have dire consequences for Guyana's financial system and will threaten our financial system. To those who are making those statements, I say that they are premature and they are 
reckless because there is no basis upon which those statements can be made. Guyana's financial system and AML CFT architecture just receiving a clean bill of health by the authorized agency, the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force. Now, I also want to deal with the maker of those statements. So, the opposition came out first, and they said that the disclosures will have a serious impact on Guyana's financial sector. First of all, I want to point to the measures that Guyana has taken since those disclosures. Because it is important to look at the actions that are taken when such disclosures are made. The permanent secretary has since tendered her resignation from both the government and from the People's Progressive Party, where she was elected recently to its central committee. But more importantly, the Honorable Dr. Ashni Singh, Minister of Finance, within hours dispatched a letter to the Treasury of the United States requesting a great volume of information that would assist Guyana in launching a probe into these allegations. This was followed almost simultaneously with the Commissioner General, Mr. Godfrey Stacia, immediately writing his counterpart in the Inland Revenue Service of the U.S., requesting another volume of information that the Guyana Revenue Authority intends to use in its investigation of the allegations made in relation to evasion of taxes. So within hours, the government of Guyana reacted and dispatched requests to the relevant agencies within the U.S. government seeking information that they obviously have at their disposal based upon their disclosures, which information and or evidence will be used by the state agencies in Guyana in pursuing investigations into the allegations made. It is also public knowledge that the central bank has indicated publicly that it has rescinded the license that was granted to the Mohammeds to operate a cambio. So these are serious and drastic steps that were taken with great promptitude and immediacy by the government of Guyana to demonstrate its commitment to fight transnational crime, financial crime, and money laundering type of activities. One of the issues that we were adjudged on was the government's commitment 
I'm speaking at the CFATF level, one of the platform upon which we were adjudged was the government's commitment and the state's commitment through all its agencies, including the judiciary, the law enforcement agencies, the financial sectors, etc. The commitment to ensure that Guyana's financial system is protected and is safe. There was no evidence whatsoever that there was a lack of such a commitment from Guyana and all the sectors. None at all. And we were scored heavily in that regard. Persons do not know and perhaps we should be making these more public. But we have a total of 187 cases pending in the criminal justice system in relation to money laundering type offenses. 187 cases pending. Now I had to explain to the plenary that we do not control the speed at which these cases are heard and determined. But you can't fault us for not filing the cases and anxiously ready or being in a state of readiness to prosecute. So we have 187 of those cases pending. We were able to show that we confiscated, I think, three aircrafts, one luxury yacht, and a ship, all involved in drug trafficking offenses. And persons were charged and in most of the cases, convicted. The point I am making is that one can't fault Guyana for its lack of attempts and its commitment to deal with organized crime across borders. Hence, we have a menu of amendments to our extradition laws currently pending in the National Assembly. All these things are connected. They are connected. So we are also forfeiting assets that are deemed to be the proceeds of crime or are connected to the conduct of criminal activities. I say all of that in my narrative in order to establish that if when Guyana's system will be reviewed again you will have firm evidence of firm action taken by the government in response to the, to, to the type of disclosures that we have had from the United States of America. The Vice President speaking on behalf of the government has made it very clear and I wish to reiterate that position here. Anyone who violates the laws of this country will be subject to the legal system. If they violate the laws of another country, then they will have to face the consequences of those violations. Of course, they are entitled to due process. They are entitled to all the facilities that the rule of law accords them. 
And as a government, it's our duty to ensure that Guyanese receive those benefits, but they must face the consequences of their actions. But I found it slightly hypocritical that suddenly the APNU AFC is concerned about our financial system. I find it hypocritical because many of you would recall what they subjected this country to and what they subjected the financial system of this country to when they had a one-seat majority in the opposition between 2011 and 2015. Because I was the Attorney General and I was in that parliament and I lived through the travails and the tribulations that they engineered and the damage that they have done because of their political postures to the financial system. And as I was reflecting upon it, I made some notes which I want to share with you. And if you will bear with me, it's a little lengthy, but it is important sometimes that we refresh our memories of these matters. So in, 20, in November 2011, the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, CIFATEF, brought to the attention of its members several jurisdictions, including Guyana, with significant strategic deficiencies in their AML-CFT regime, with a view to encouraging the expeditious rectification of the identified strategic deficiencies, the CIFATEF in conjunction with Guyana developed an action plan with identified targets dates to address the strategic deficiencies that existed in its national architecture to combat money laundering and the financing of terrorism. So in November 2011, as the year that we went to the elections and they won the one seat majority and we became a minority government. The same time, CIFATEF said, look, there are a number of countries in the Caribbean and you have strategic deficiencies. In terms of Guyana, they came to Guyana and they identified those deficiencies and they worked out a plan to work with Guyana to correct those deficiencies. On May 29, 2013, CIFATEF issued a statement noting that Guyana had failed to make sufficient progress in addressing its significant strategic AML CFT deficiencies, including certain legislative reforms. The statement, however, mentioned that Guyana introduced an amendment bill into the parliament to address the deficiencies and CIFATEF encouraged Guyana to urgently approve and implement these legislative amendments. So we took a bill to the parliament. We took a bill to the parliament, a bill that would have addressed the deficiencies identified, but we were not controlling the parliament. And the bill was left there for a very long time, because the opposition, with a one-seat majority, refused to support the bill. We explained over and over again the damage that this will do to the financial system of the country. We explained over and over again that this has nothing to do with politics, that this is simply 
implementing recommendations which Guyana must implement to protect its legal system. Yet, the opposition refused and used this as a bargaining political chip to demand a whole set of things and make political demands before they support this bill. But I'll continue. The statement continued that if Guyana does not take specific steps by November 2013, then CIFATEF will identify Guyana as not taking sufficient steps to address its AML CFT deficiency and will take additional steps of calling upon its members to consider implementing countermeasures to protect their financial system from the ongoing money laundering and terrorist terrorist financing risks emanating from Guyana and at that time CIFATEF will consider referring Guyana to the Financial Action Task Force International Cooperation Review Group, the FATF ICRG. So the people are basically begging us that unless you pass these laws, we will warn the rest of the Caribbean and the international community that you are refusing to pass laws and that your system is contaminated and that you are in, in complicity with terrorists and money launderers because whatever, what is the other reason? What is the reason for not passing this law? That is what the people are saying here to us. Yet the opposition was unmoved Today, they want us to believe that they care and they are concerned about our financial system. But I'll continue. The Anti-Money Laundering and Countering the Financing of Terrorism Amendment Bill 2013 was read for a first time on April 22, 2013 in the 10th Parliament. The bill was committed to a special select committee on May 7th and remained there until October 2013 when the government alone considered it and decided to wrap it up. The bill was eventually voted down in the National Assembly on November 7, 2013 by a majority of opposition voting 33 to 28, six months after the bill was tabled in the House. So these very ones now who are concerned about our financial system, when we took the bill and read it for the first time, this is after trying to get them months to support the bill, and that's why we couldn't read it before, because they were not supporting it, we went ahead and we read it for the first time in April 2013. They voted and sent the bill to a select committee where the bill remained until October 2013. In the select committee, every single meeting, they refused to support the bill. They left the bill in there for six months, voting down all the amendments that we are putting in the select committee. And then one day they stopped coming and we decided to wrap up the bill, the work of the select committee and take the bill back to the outer house. And on November the 7th, by a majority, they voted the bill down. They voted the bill down. And these guys now want us today to accept that they have great concern for the financial sector of our country. I'm not finished, I'll continue. On November the 7th, 2013, the opposition also voted on a motion for the reading of a petition submitted by the Private Sector Commission on the bill. The Private Sector Commission petitioned the National Assembly to pass the bill because they knew the consequences that this, the failing to pass the bill will have on the financial sector and on the private sector. The opposition voted down the private sector motion. 
The private sector said, and I quote, no written submissions have been forthcoming from the opposition as it relates to adjustments to the bill as deemed amendable by the opposition. And their failure to enact such a legislation will result in the blacklisting of Guyana by other countries and that such blacklisting will result in severe hardship for the business community and the ordinary citizens. The opposition, the private sector was pleading with them, saying, look, you're not even putting forward an amendment. If you have a problem with what the government is proposing, then put something, put a counter proposal, they're putting nothing. And the, opposite, the private sector is warning them that if you don't do that and you don't pass this bill, Guyana will be blacklisted and there are going to be dire consequences for the financial sector, the private sector, and the ordinary citizen. On November the 30th, 2013, November 30th, 2013, CFATF issued a following statement. Quote, Guyana has made efforts to address its deficiencies. However, it has not taken sufficient steps towards improving its AML-CFT compliance regime by failing to approve and implement required legislative reforms and call upon members to consider implementing countermeasures to protect their financial systems from ongoing money laundering and terrorist financing risks emanating from Guyana. The CFATF in November is telling us that we have failed to pass the law and as a result we continue to be a risk and they are advising their members to consider implementing countermeasures, penal sanctions, that's what they're calling countermeasures, to protect their financial systems from the ongoing money laundering and terrorist financing risks emanating from Guyana, unquote. I'll make this document public that I'm reading from, because these are excerpts of what transpired. The 2013 bill was reintroduced to the 10th parliament. After they voted on, we brought it back again in December. They voted it down in November. We brought it back in December. The bill was debated on December the 19th and again sent to a special select committee. The bill was debated on the 19th of December and sent to a special select committee. At the special select committee, they boycotted it again. They boycotted the special select committee. The select committee met on 15 occasions between January 19, 2014 and February 27, 2014. 15 times in one month. And at this ninth meeting held on February 9, 2014, the select committee concluded its work. And four amendments were proposed. In February 2014, February 21, 2014, CFATF financial advisor Roger Hernandez came to Guyana and appealed to the special select committee and informed us that if the bill was not passed by the National Assembly by Friday the 28th of February 2014, CFATF would nominate Guyana for a prima facie review by the Financial Action Task Force in June 2014. And the country would be blacklisted globally by the Financial Action Task Force. That is what Hernandez, a mem a, a, an employee of the CFATF, came to the select committee to tell the select committee that if we don't pass this bill by the end of February, CFATF will put the matter over to FATF and Guyana will be blacklisted globally. Then on April 28, 2014, the Honorable Alison Maynard Gibson, Attorney General of Bahamas, in her capacity as the chair of CFATF, visited Guyana and brought a high-level team to Guyana 
to meet with the opposition and meet with the government with an effort to get the opposition to support the amendments in the parliament. And I can go through the whole thing. In the end, they voted down all the amendments. They voted down all the amendments. President Ramatar met with the president, uh, opposition leader Granger in an effort to get the amendments passed. That did not succeed. That did not yield any success. And in the end, the bills were voted down and Guyana was blacklisted. And all of this was caused by this very opposition who are now expressing concern and worry for our financial system. And this, what I outlined here to you, is what they did to the financial system of this country. When they won the government, they then brought the bills. And you know what? We supported them in 2016 and 2015. They brought the two sets of bills that they voted down, one in 2015 and one in 2016. And as opposition, we supported both pieces of legislation unanimously. We could have said, well, you did this to us when you were in government. We are not going to support it. But no because it was important for Guyana, because it was bills of national importance, because our financial system depended upon those bills, we offered our unequivocal support to those bills when we were in the opposition and they were all passed. And the process begun of Guyana extricating itself from the blacklisting. And you know what the blacklisting caused Guyanese. You could, up to now, we are still recovering from some of those consequences. You couldn't send money to Western Union. You had a state source of funds. Many banks that were, had um, relationship, international banks that had relationships with banks in Guyana, several relations. We couldn't get loans from the international community. Contracts were canceled. Financing that we were getting for international projects from international financial institutions. Those, all those financings were, financing were pulled. That is what they expose this country to. That is what they expose this country to. And today, like wolves, no, sheep in wolves' clothing. They want us to take them seriously and to accept that they have concerns about our financial system. They have none. All they are concerned about is about politics and getting into power. That was their agenda. If they destroy the economy, the government will look bad and more people will vote for them. That is why they cut all the national budget during that period. That is why they voted down amendments to the custom laws, causing us to lose a case at the Caribbean Court of Justice to Rudisa, where we had to pay six million US and Rudisa was prepared to withdraw the case if you we were able to pass the amendment to the Customs Act to remove an environmental tax from bottles. They refused to support the amendment. And six million US dollars we had to pay Rudisa. And they paid it as soon as they got into government. Don't tell me about, I don't know what happened. But there are a lot of allegations surrounding that 
six million dollars payment. Many of them were driving a particular brand of cars when they were in opposition. Brand new. Many of them. The cars were distributed by that very company. And these guys concerned about our financial uh, system. And that is what they did. We had worked out with Rodisa because they said in the witness box at the Caribbean Court of Justice, the court sat in its original jurisdiction. And I cross-examined witnesses at that level. And I was able to get from the witnesses that they were undervaluing of invoices when they brought products into Guyana. And an agreement was arrived at between the GRA and Rudisa that instead of doing an audit, we will wipe the slate clean so that we will not pursue the under invoicing and the six million judgment will not be enforced. That was the agreement that we were about to sign and we lost the government. And when we got into government, I briefed Basil Williams about that agreement. They tossed the agreement aside and they went ahead and paid the six million dollars US dollar judgment, 1.2 billion. Why? Because it was prearranged. It was prearranged. And these guys are talking about corruption and about financial, the health of our financial system. They care. They could only talk these things to people who don't know. Or they can talk these things to people who they think suffer from amnesia. But I've just given you a litany of facts to show you, one, that our financial system is not in any unhealthy state. And these persons are unqualified. Unqualified, morally and politically, to question the health of our financial system because they have plunged us into chaos and made us a blacklisted country internationally. So we have a few minutes left. Let me look at some of your comments. So I, <laughs> I'm looking at the comments here and you're, you're all agreeing with me. Nobody asking me a question to explain any, any issue. I thought that you, you know, would have asked me something. But I'm happy that I've had this opportunity to share with you a number of important facts regarding our Fort Rung Mutual Evaluation Exercise and the being able to comment on the public um, statements expressed regarding the impact or possible impact that the disclosures made by the U.S. can have on our financial system. I believe as I said, I believe that those um, statements are premature and they are baseless and they are opportunistic and perhaps there is some degree of optimism because these people may want us to have problems in the financial sector. They are, they are, they are expressing that those statements with a sense of hope. I get that impression. Opportunistically and perhaps with some degree of optimism. They're hoping that we can have, it can have adverse consequences. Lastly, tomorrow, the Ministry of Housing 
and the Central Housing and Planning Authority will be launching the single window system. You will recall that we passed a, a legislation, a bill, which is now an act to bring into operation this single window system that will allow for persons to get planning and building permissions with ease. The system, we had to build the system, we had to create the, the, the platform, we had to create the physical um, administrative structure, and of course we had to bring in the computer and technological platforms that will facilitate and enable the process. All of that are now completed and tomorrow at the Arthur Chung Convention Center we will be launching that very important initiative it is intended to remove all the bureaucratic red tapes and all the corruption and the sloth and bureaucracy that afflict the system. You go and you give all your paperwork at one window and they give you a date and you come back to that window for your approvals. If they require any information along the way, then you will be informed. Importantly, the law stipulates that at every stage a time limit is prescribed for how long your paperwork will stay at that desk. So your plan will not be at city council for more than six weeks. If it is there for more than six weeks, and it is not approved, and they don't ask you anything, the law says that it is deemed to be approved. And that's the kind of system that will bring great speed, expedience, and fluidity in the administrative machinery of the government. Because many, many people who want to build and who want to get businesses done and so on, they are stalled at every step of the way, with bribes being extracted from them. Or the people is just left there and no one attends to them. That will not happen anymore. Well, we are trying to eliminate, well, reduce it first, and then eventually eliminate it. This system, as I said, is revolutionary and we don't expect it to work perfectly. It will have hiccups, it will have teething problems, but hopefully we are able to address it and we will have an efficient running machinery in the immediate future. I don't think that such a system exists yet anywhere in the Caribbean. I don't think so. Guyana would be the first to be implementing this system. It is ambitious and we will put our shoulders to the wheel to ensure that it works as quickly as possible. As I said, we are going to have problems in the beginning because it's a series of agencies, fire, Guyana Fire Service, Main City Council, the RDCs, the NDCs, the Environmental Protection Agencies, the Central Housing and Planning Authority, the Public Health Authority. So it's a number of agencies that these paperwork got to pass through and it is going to be done electronically most of the time. So I want to thank you very much for spending the 
last hour with me. I have dealt with a number of issues. I hope that I have disabused your minds from a lot of misinformation that's being peddled out there. And I want to thank you very much for sharing your hour with me until next week. Please take care and we will reunite next week for another discourse on issues in the news. Thank you very much.